As I mentioned, we're looking at Lord's Day 24 this afternoon in the back of the Book of Praise that can be found on page 538. Lord's Day 24. This is the uh, how far Grace Church here has come in the catechism preaching. Uh, so last week, looking at justification, how you're made righteous before God by faith alone in Jesus Christ, not anything to do with yourself. And since it's by faith in Jesus Christ that you're saved, Lord's Day 24 follows that up with several questions about good works. So Lord's Day 24, question 62 asks, but why can our good works not be our righteousness before God, or at least a part of it? The answer, because the righteousness which can stand before God's judgment must be absolutely perfect and in complete agreement with the law of God. Whereas even our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. But do our good works earn nothing, even though God promises to reward them in this life and the next? The answer, the, this reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. And the final question, does this teaching not make people careless and wicked? No. It is impossible that those grafted into Christ by true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. That's what the Catechism summarizes is the teaching of God's word throughout Scripture on good works. The congregation, the Lord Jesus Christ, your grace and courage guests, I want to begin this afternoon by talking a little bit about a man named William Wilberforce. He might be familiar to some Reformed Christians who uh, know British history quite well. William Wilberforce was the politician in the uh, in Britain or in England who never gave up in persevering in trying to abolish the slave trade in Britain. After decades of seemingly getting nowhere, finally it happened. Uh, that was one of the things that he was most famous for in the 1800s. But he was also quite well known in Britain for just being a, a good person, for doing a lot of good things all over the place. Uh, some of his friends described him as somebody who lacked time for half the good works that he had in his mind. And uh, another friend described him as, as having schemes of benevolence springing up more rapidly beneath his roof than factories in the cities of Leeds and Manchester in the 1800s, which apparently was very common. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, when all these factories were coming and, and being built. In other words, William Wilberforce was not just a, a great politician, did great things that we remember still today, uh, he also is, you could say, a bit of an expert on good works. He even wrote a book on why we should do good works and how we should do good works. Uh, but as one other author I was reading pointed out, uh, when Wilberforce wrote that book seeking to, to stir up change within his country so that people would do good more and, and live uh, better and more according to God's word, he didn't write a book with all kinds of, you know, effective strategies for good living, top 10 tips for, you know, self-control or something like that. He didn't even go through a list of the Ten Commandments. William Wilberforce wrote a book on doctrine. He wrote a book on what God's Word teaches about what you're looking at here in this part of the catechism, justification. That was last week's sermon by Pastor Matthew in Lord's Day 23, when it came to how we are saved, it's by true faith in Jesus Christ. That's when we're justified. That's when we're made right in God's sight. God looks at us and he says, you're righteous, even though we haven't done any good ourselves. That's what Wilberforce wrote on. 
And you'd think, well, why, why is he doing that? Well, he understood that massive practical action for good comes about not, first of all, as a result of, of moral exhortation, pleading with people to, you know, be better, live better according to God's Word, uh, appeals to, to change, but instead, massive practical action for good comes about as a result of understanding and embracing this doctrine of justification by faith alone. What is it about this doctrine that brings out such powerful action for good? Well, that's what we hope to explore this afternoon uh, in terms of uh, the theme being zealous or eager for good works. We're going to look at the, the dangers and the, the motivations in terms of, of this desire to be eager to do good works. Lord's Day 24, uh, it's, it's wondering, after being told about this doctrine of justification, what, what's the point of doing any good anymore? It, it almost actually seems to be the opposite result. Instead of really wanting to do good works, well, if everything's been done for me already, I, there's nothing left to do. I'm, I can just sit back and relax. Why, why do I still have to do anything? Can't, can't our good works do something. The two question and answers, 62 and 63, are two different dangers that come into play when it comes to what we should now do now that we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So what's the first danger? Well, the, the first danger is looking at, at question 62, thinking that our good works can be at least a part of our righteousness before God. It should be something that we need to do in order to have God be pleased with us. So this is referring back to some of the things that you probably looked at as a congregation last week in Lord's Day 23. If you would flip the page back, what is it to be made righteous before God? It's, it's that God looks at us and He sees, yes, we were really sinful. We had nothing good in our record. If he had kept a record of all the commandments that we kept on this side and all the commandments that we didn't keep on this side, well, all the ones that we did keep, he can't put a check mark by any of those. We got nothing on that. And not only did we not keep any, but we also disobeyed or failed to keep so many that, that all of the bad things that we did, all the sins, that's, that's filled. All the commandments we've sinned against. So when God looks at us naturally, we have, well, we're in a, a state of misery because we have nothing on our record that's good. But Jesus Christ comes along and with his perfect record, he's kept all the commandments. He's never sinned against any of them. And God says, I'm going to take Jesus Christ's record and you are going to have that one instead. I'm going to punish him in your place, and you get his record. That's my grace. You don't have to do anything for it. That's the doctrine of justification. You're made right in front of God because of what Jesus Christ did, and it's beautiful. So what about good works then? How can, what, what role do they have now? Well, this first question, it shows, question 62, it shows that there's this desire in us to say, well, can it just, can't Jesus really kind of help us along? So, you know, he's done great things and we want to honor him, but shouldn't we speak in terms of, you know, Jesus gets us out of the hole and now he's going to walk alongside us and, and help us, but we still have to do some stuff. We got to still be righteous. We got we to gotta still, you know, do our part to get across the finish line, so to speak. It actually could be really motivating so that, you know, we'd really be eager, really be zealous to do good works. You could even say to someone, look, Jesus died for you. That's how much he loves you. Now, go and do these things, these good things. Start living better or it would be all for nothing. You need to start obeying God's law properly or else the whole thing falls apart. That, that sounds pretty motivating to me. 
I want to be eager to, to do good works if that's going to be the case. The problem is, as the Catechism points out, that if salvation depended on our righteousness, even just a little bit, we'd never make it. Our best works, it says, they're all imperfect and defiled with sin. They're just not good enough. As motivated as we would think we would be, that motivation wouldn't push us over the top to actually accomplishing any of the righteousness God wants from us. Because what's the righteousness God wants from us? Jesus described it in Matthew 5 in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, you must be perfect just as the Heavenly Father is perfect. That's the standard that you would need to meet in order to accomplish this salvation thing of, of God being pleased with you and welcoming you into heaven with him. And to be honest, we wouldn't want perfection to be not the standard. We wouldn't want that standard to be any lower than perfection because if the standard was just, uh, you know, having a good attitude or putting in good effort and that was good enough for a good work, then that would mean we're okay with, with people still getting hurt all the time by each other, with society still being so far short of what it should be, corruption everywhere, injustice everywhere. Because everyone, you could probably look around, there's a lot of people that are trying pretty hard, making a good effort of being good, and look where it's getting us. There's still all kinds of difficulties, and we've been trying for thousands of years. So we shouldn't be okay with a standard that's lower than perfection in terms of good works. And thankfully, God's not okay with it either. He demanded perfection, and only one person ever has actually accomplished it, and that was Jesus Christ. And God provided him for us. Titus 3 talks about this in verse 5. He's talking about God, our Savior, how, uh, and I, I quote, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. It, there's nothing of righteousness that we're going to be able to do that's going to get us saved. It's his righteousness that he provided with his mercy. If in Christianity you still have to do just a little bit of righteousness in order to be saved, then it would be no different than so many other religions out there that have their standards that you have to keep, whether it's many or, or few. That, that's what religions have in common. You know, you, you have, if you're going to be a part of the, the religious community, you meet these different standards and you're welcome and, and good things will happen to you. That, that tends to be the pattern. The problem is every religious person ends up under a burden of having to meet that moral standard, whatever standard that might be. But that's not the true that's not the true teaching of the gospel of the scriptures, which is, it's not a new set of rules that, well, now Jesus has done this, now you got to do this or else. It is at its heart a gospel, an announcement saying, there's good news. Jesus Christ has done it for you. It's finished. That was what he said on the cross. So question 62 and its answer, it's, it's presenting this first danger that Christians can face, which is the temptation to motivate ourselves by thinking uh, we have to do this or else we're not going to be saved. Well, if that's the case, then the gospel is not good news. In the end, that motivation would turn into these chains that's just dragging us down or weighing us down, burdening us with guilt every time things are not just right. The Christian church should not be the place for only the perfectionists that just barely made it. Christian church is for those that know they can't make it and they cling to Jesus Christ. But that's not the only danger. There's other ways we can twist this to, to, to try come at it a different way. We're pretty competitive as human beings and we want to compete. We want to try do things in order to earn things. And question 63 shows us a different way that we can do that. It, has, it talks about rewards. So say Jesus has done everything for us to get to e eternal life with God. But once we get there, 
What if what happens to us in eternal life, in heaven, is going to be based on how many good works we still did in this life? The question even uses a a proof text from from Scripture. You can see a footnote in, in question 63. It's one of the few questions in the catechism that has a footnote. And it references the fact that we are going to get rewarded, not only in this life, but also in the next, for good works. Well, that sounds good. I want rewards. Let's go get rewards. Let's do all kinds of good for these rewards. God promises to reward us a little bit now. He will in the future when we do good, so let, let's get at it. And we can have this mentality as well. We think Jesus, Jesus has saved us, but it, it, it's like he, he helps us get to the finish line, but right now, how we live determines whether we're going to be first to the finish line or last to the finish line. Are we going to be ripping over that line or just barely squeaking over? So yeah, we're still going to be judged And the reward could be great if we do lots of good, but we could even face some sort of of punishment, maybe we think to ourselves, if we don't if we don't do good enough. Maybe it'll be temporary or something like that. And then we'll finally get to to heaven after we pay for some things. The the first thing to say in response is that the, the catechism, when it uses that proof text, is not entirely wrong. There are rewards for good works in heaven. Even here on this earth, there are blessings that happen when you follow the commandments of God. He wants that, and he often blesses us when we do good. The only issue, though, is what the Catechism says. It it tells us that none of these things are things that we've done on our own. None of these things are things that we can point to ourselves and say, that's me. I did that. It's always God giving them to us in grace. They're worked in us by God. There's a couple passages, excuse me, from Scripture that speak of this. Um, Ephesians 2, verse 10, I believe it was read last week in connection with Lord's Day 23. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 10, is speaking of how we're a handiwork, God's handiwork. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God actually prepared those good works for us to do. It's not us doing them, but Him doing them in us. And that's confirmed by another passage, one book later, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It says there, brothers and sisters, or sorry, uh, 2 verse 13, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is the one that if we're ever going to do anything that's worthwhile, anything that's good, we have to point to him and say he's the one that actually did it. He prepared it. He's working in us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not me. There's nothing here on me. Any rewards that we would get, we'd have to point and say that was because God decided to give it. It's grace. That's answer 63. This reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. And hopefully you can begin to see why if our ability, our ability to to do good works determined our rewards, why that would become such a danger. It it would turn into this never-ending competition where we're always just trying to do better than everybody else. We have to outperform our fellow Christians because we want to get the better rewards in heaven. You don't want to miss out on on what might happen in eternity. If you think, well, at least these teachings would would motivate people to do good, well, I, I invite you to just consider what can sometimes happen in churches where there is this kind of competitive spirit. It it can slip into Christian churches, reformed churches even. There are There are sometimes different levels of of piety and and members can come up and say, well, I I just, just, I just, I don't feel like I fit in here. I I don't think I can reach the level of piety that some people have. You know, I I see people coming to church twice on a Sunday. That that sounds ridiculous. I don't know if I can do that. 
That sounds like a huge commitment. I, I, I see some people and they, they come to Bible study every week and they never miss anything. I, I don't know if I fit in. If that's the expectation. And sometimes churches can, can almost have these expectations that are there and, and if people don't match up to those expectations, well then they're just not good enough Christians. Or you can consider the the Roman Catholic Church, it has this quite a bit. I, I know, know of several Roman Catholic neighbors that uh, have come from di- kind of different, different ranges on the scale, you could say, of the spectrum in the Roman Catholic Church. Some of them are devout. They are pious, we would say. They go to Catholic school. They, they get taught the Roman Catholic catechism. They grow up and they're involved. They're volunteering at different programs. They're fighting for different uh, social injustices or against them, I should say. Uh, maybe they... Uh, as they grow up, they participate as an altar boy or an altar girl, and they're, they're just busy, and they're within the life of that church. But then there's also those that just show up at, at Christmas and Easter. I'm, I'm Catholic, but uh, you know, I, I do those things. I go to Mass every once in a while. They say they believe in God, but they know they're not good enough to meet kind of that, that high-level standard that these other people have. And the logic seems to go, well, if, if God is going to, to punish me for not doing all those things, sorry, if, I should say, if, if God is going to, to let me off the hook through Jesus Christ, then uh, he can't be that mean. You know, the, the, he's a gracious God. I'm doing good enough. I, I've met the standard, and I'm going to make it. Even though I'm not going to, you know, be a supreme Roman Catholic, I, I'm still in. So that's good. But there's also others that they get to a point where they they feel like they don't they don't match up. They they want to be the the highest of the highest, but they can't get there. They feel like something's holding them back, and they get so despondent, so despairing that they end up just wandering away from the Bible altogether. And that's something that can end up happening not just in the Roman Catholic Church, that can happen in, in the, the Reformed Church. Even when the gospel is being preached, we can get to this point where we think, well, the expectations are too high. I just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't keep up with the elite. The, the measure of good works might be motivating to some, but it would probably only be motivating to the ones that would feel comfortable enough that they're doing better than almost everybody else. But that's, those are the wrong standards to be measuring at. And when you start measuring by the right standards, like Martin Luther did, he realized that ultimately you're not, you can't keep up to the highest of standards. He kept failing. He was way more pious than any Roman Catholic monk back at monk in, in the 1500s. And he thought that he just kept failing and kept failing to be perfect, to doing lots of good. But as many Reformed people know, that's why he was able to see that the Scriptures were pointing him to Christ alone and to the mercy that Jesus Christ displays. And Titus says this, or the, the, the letter to Titus, Paul in Titus 2, verse 11, says, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It's the grace of God that comes, and that's what makes the difference. So we've looked at the dangers. You can try to think that you have to have some sort of righteousness, or you can try to earn rewards for later on in, in heaven, but it all comes back to the fact that it's Jesus Christ who saves us by grace alone. Now, how does that motivate us? If all these other things are bad motivations or dangerous motivations, how does this justification motivate us? Won't this, as the question 64 asks, won't this make people careless and wicked, lazy, don't have to do anything good, Okay, no pressure on me. I'll just do whatever I want. The Bible's answer to this and and Wilberforce's answer as well in his book is is what we'll look at in our second point, uh, the the true motivation for good works, to be zealous in them. 
And there are two places in, in the passage that we read in Titus that speak to this. The first one I want to look at is, is in verses 4 through 8. There are a couple of important, we call them so that statements or result statements or purpose statements. You could even say uh, something is done so that something else might happen. So you can see that in uh, verse 7 begins with a so that and also verse 8. Uh, has a so that in it as well. But what's happening here? Well, let's start with verse 4. The kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Again, that's the gospel of justification right there. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, here's the first so that, verse 7, so that having been justified by his grace, that's what happened, the result is we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. That is ours. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 8, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. In other words, I want you to stress the gospel of justification. I want you to stress that it's only by grace through Jesus Christ. Why? Verse 8 again, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. They want to do good works because they, they are reminded of the doctrine of justification. Paul is telling us like William Wilberforce, Wilberforce wanted to stress in his book uh, that you need to teach people the good news about justification, about being saved by grace alone in Jesus Christ, and it's him only, so that they have the desire to carefully and eagerly do good works, to devote themselves to it. The logic is that when you know what Jesus Christ has done for you, that leads to this, this eagerness, this zeal, this careful devotion to good. And why is that? Why does it work that way? Well, think of, for a moment of, of Jesus' words to the Pharisees in Luke 7 when he forgives a, a sinful woman who comes and anoints him with expensive perfume. Uh, Jesus says, he talks about how the one who is forgiven little loves little, but for the woman who had many sins, she loves much, and she's devoted to doing great good, even giving up this expensive ointment for him. But when you realize how helpless you are, how full of sin you are, how ultimately miserable we all are because sin controls us and conquers us, when you actually see that Jesus Christ completely relieves you of the responsibility to save yourself and do the good that will get you to heaven, that should mean for all of us an immense amount of joy, an immense amount of love because we've been forgiven so much. We should all realize how much we've been forgiven. Paul says that he's the worst of sinners. We should all say to ourselves when we know ourselves truly, I'm the worst of sinners. Because when we realize how much sin we have, that will then lead us to realize how much we ought to love God for what he's given us in Jesus Christ. The joyous truth of undeserved forgiveness, it changes your desires, it changes your loves, it changes what you want in life, it changes your goals. Teaching morals alone, do this, don't do this, won't result in morality. Because it is the desires in your heart that make the difference, that will change what actually happens on the outside. That's, that, that's what Jesus aimed at with his teachings. That's why he said that it's not anything on the outside that makes you unclean. It's what's on the inside that makes you unclean. It's why he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the only thing that changes the heart is believing in the beautiful truths 
of what Jesus Christ has done for you and, and being taken hold of by an awe of how glorious Jesus Christ really is for what he did. It drives out every sinful desire because you're so enamored by the good that he has done, the perfection that he has done. It wasn't just Mar William uh, Wilberforce or the Apostle Paul that saw this. Uh, Martin Luther saw this connection between the truth of the gospel and being motivated to do good works. He knew a thing or two about trying to sneak good works into some of what you need to do to earn anything. He wrote a book called The Freedom of the Christian, and he starts in that book by describing how sinful he is and how God has justified him in Jesus Christ without any merit on my part, he says. And he goes on, and I quote, so that from now on I need nothing except faith which believes that this is true. That's all I need. Why should I not therefore freely, joyfully, with all my heart and with an eager will do all things which I know are pleasing and acceptable to such a father who has overwhelmed me with his inestimable riches? I will therefore give myself as a Christ to my neighbor, just as Christ offered himself to me. I will do nothing in this life except what I see is necessary, profitable, and salutary to my neighbor, since through faith I have an abundance of all good things in Christ. Do, do you see how this, that's the end of the quote, do, do you see how all this makes sense though? It's because Christ has given us everything that now you, you don't have to do good works, but it's because you don't have to that now you actually want to because you want to please him. You want to thank him. You want to show your love to him. And I think in, in the letter to, to Titus that we, we read, the key is in the word eager that comes out in chapter 2, verse 14. Eager. And I'll explain it. It says there uh, that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So Jesus didn't save us to, to force us to do good works. He died for us so that now he would have a, a people that are zealous, eager, enthusiastic. They actually want to do good. They don't have to be told to. And on top of that zeal and enthusiasm, Brothers and sisters, ultimately, this is the only way we can truly do a good work. It, a, a good work that actually is not selfish at all. Because if we're not saved at all, if we have to do something in order to be saved, some good, well, well then anything that we do that's good will have some sort of selfish motivation for me so that I get somewhere, so that I get reward, so that I... Uh, so I make it to, to heaven. But if you're fully taken care of by God's grace, you don't need to get into heaven because you already have it as a promise. You don't need to gain rewards because those are all given by God's grace. That frees you to have your whole life eager to do things for others, to give yourself as a Christ to others. There, there doesn't have to be a, a selfish motive at all. Religious people, people of, who don't know the gospel, they can always be accused of, of being nice well, because they have to. Because you're following your religion. That's what you're told you have to do. But truly, the Christian doesn't. And thanks be to God for that. Jesus did all and said it's finished so that you're free. And now you can do things for others enthusiastically and not... And it's clearly not at all for your own sake because there's no gain for you. It's purely for God and for others. It's, it can approach at least true selflessness by the working of the Holy Spirit. That's then how we can read the answer in answer 64 of the Catechism that it really is impossible it really is impossible that those grafted into Christ by faith 
should not produce good works, fruits of thankfulness. That's what good works should be called now by Christians. They have a different name. They're fruits of thankfulness. They, we produce them because we're thankful for what God has done for us. And we just won't not do that if we see what he's done and we believe it. So how are you now going to live when you realize what Jesus Christ has done for you? Paul's letter to Titus shows us what it starts to look like. There is a, there is a way in which it, it looks like something because we're wanting to show good to God. We're wanting to show love. That's what God showed to us. We want to show that to the world. And so some of these things start to come out. You can read them in verses 12 and 13. There won't be any ungodly, well, there won't be any. We'll start to say no to ungodliness. The gospel trains us to be able to say, I don't really need these worldly passions anymore. I don't need to go after that thing that I thought I wanted so much. It's really not all that important anymore. And instead, we, we grow in self-control. Uh, chapter 3 starts talking about how we, we submit to rulers and authorities. We're obedient. We're ready to do whatever is good. We don't want to slander anyone. We, we start to be peaceable, considerate, always gentle toward everyone. Why? Because these are the things that Jesus Christ has done towards us. And we realize how much of a blessing that was, and we just want to you know, fill this world with his grace and his goodness. And speak of that gospel of salvation to them. But the, the, the heart, the heart of a, the Christian that has been saved by the gospel is not limited to just these things in Titus 2 and Titus 3. The Christian already has all they need. So they spend their life eagerly to provide others with what they need, to be there for them. They put aside their own advancement, their own earthly treasures and possessions. It comes back to that word love as the Apostle John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You're free to love with nothing else needed in return because you have everything. You have an abundance of riches in Jesus Christ how free you are and how glorious the redeeming work of Jesus Christ is, which is now still today transforming lives to produce people who are eager to do good works. Praise the Lord for that. Amen.